everybody. This is Don LaGreca from the Michael K Show. When it comes to talking sports, Bob Walters and Brett Grasso are the authority. Can't wait. When it comes to talking sports, they're the authority. It's Bob Walters and Brett Grasso. It's Lock Up Sports, and it starts now. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey. Bring them out, bring them out. Yeah. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey. Bring them out. Here we go! From the Brian Gunzel Studios, I'm Bob Walters. This is Locked Up Sports. Merry Christmas, everybody. The Giants are officially out of the playoffs. The Jets get a win. They survive a huge comeback, almost blow a huge lead. No Yamamoto under the tree for the Mets. And the Ravens dominate the 49ers in the big game today here on Christmas Day. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Bob Walters. How are you? I hope you have a merry, you had a merry Christmas. It is now late Christmas night. Uh, it's just about all over. Everything's done. The shopping's done. The gift giving's done. Everybody's unwrapped and and mostly gone to sleep now. Is the the I just finished watching up the Ravens and the Niners and what was supposed to be the best game of the day turned out to be not so good. Um, the Ravens dominated. Brock Purdy looked overwhelmed today. He looked um, like the the moment was too big for him. He went in there. He threw four picks. They had five picks total as Sam Donald came in. He actually led uh, the Niners on a, on a touchdown drive. But Brock Purdy got nothing. He could do nothing today. The Ravens defense was all over the place. Lamar Jackson was great as usual. And I told you that I've been on the Ravens now for a couple weeks as my Super Bowl pick right now. And they're the best team in the NFL. They are hands down the best team in the NFL. They went into San Francisco and dominated the game. They be, it was even closer than the score indicates because they were up, uh, they were up uh, 16, 12 at half, but they had dominated the first half, three turnovers. The 49ers were lucky to be in that game. You turn the ball over three times in a half and to only be down four points. You are lucky to be in that game. That is, that is a, a gift that the Ravens didn't score more. The Niners defense held them in as long as they could but the Niners just kept turning the ball over and it just kept making mistake after mistake after mistake. Brock Purdy was not good at all. I mean, they contained McCaffrey. They just doubled him. They had a spy on McCaffrey. And if you, if Purdy can't do anything and McCaffrey and you don't let McCaffrey beat you, then the Niners are just knocked down to almost an average football team. They have the good defense, but the defense can only keep you in the game so long when your offense keeps making mistakes. And that's what happened. And then, Lamar Jackson took control of the game and he just, he showed why he's the MVP this year, to be honest with you. He's definitely, uh, Brock Purdy is now out of the conversation for MVP. I didn't think he was, he was, should have been in the conversation anyway. I, not that he's not a good player, but you know, he just, he, he has a good supporting cast. He's got McCaffrey. A lot of his stuff is dump offs. He's listening. He's, he's, he's had an excellent season and he's done fantastic. The fact that he's even in the conversation is is wild coming out of being the Mr. Irrelevant just a couple of years ago. So the 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 Ravens in what was supposed to be the game of the day turned out to be the most lopsided game of the day, to be honest with you. But give the Ravens credit. They are a tough team. They are they are probably gonna be the one seed, a win next week, and they guarantee home field advantage, the bye, everything, and the road to the Super Bowl will go through Baltimore, just like I told you. I told you that, that that Baltimore was the best team in the NFL, and I think tonight that they proved it is what I think happened. Um, the Giants, the Giants, oh, the Giants. You know what? They had a chance. They had a chance today. The Eagles almost gift wrapped up a game, and they just couldn't. They couldn't take advantage of it. Just mistakes. Too many mistakes for the Giants. Listen, I heard a lot of people that have a problem with the fact that Tommy DeVito got pulled at halftime in uh, for. Tyrod Taylor, and I think you're crazy. What are you watching? Did you watch the first half? In the first half, DeVito was 9 of 16, 55 yards. That's like a Jets quarterback line. That's a disaster. 9 of 15, 9 of 16 for 55 yards. You can't have that. You're not going to beat anybody. Tyrod Taylor came in. Tyrod Taylor went 7 of 16 for 133 yards. Not much better. Now, granted, the Giants' comeback was basically built on the back of Eagles mistakes that they're running into each other it, uh, on a, on a kickoff. Okay. But, but 
Taylor did get him down there, a couple good drives. He just looks the part. He's a, you could tell he throws it with more confidence. He throws it harder. He throws it more accurately. He's just a better quarterback. He's got more talent than Tommy DeVito. And we I've been telling you this now for for since DeVito took over that he's not an NFL quarterback. He looks like I my father actually had a had a perfect description when I said I said, Oh, they pulled DeVito and he was walking out of the room and he just turned around and he goes, Oh, he looks like a high school kid out there. And he does. And I'm, I don't mean like as young and whatever, but he's small, he's undersized, he just doesn't he doesn't throw the ball with confidence. He's just not good enough to be an NFL quarterback. He's okay to have as a a backup or a third string as an emergency quarterback. We, you can't rely on him to win games. And listen, at halftime, Dable finally had seen enough. Okay, the, the DeVito thing was over. Nine of 16 for 55 yards, it's over. He pulled him, put Tyrod Taylor out there, probably just also to get a spark from the team. It worked. The Giants went right down the field, scored a touchdown. Then they had the mishap where the Eagles ran into each other on the kickoff, on the ensuing kickoff. Fumble, Giants get the ball. But the Giants missed a lot of opportunities. In the first half, the Giants, they had a sure pick six right in the hands of, I believe it was Samuels, right in his hands, and he dropped it. He would have went the other way. The Giants had a lot of penalties. At the end of the game on the last drive, again, terrible clock management. And I don't know what the problem is with the Giants at the end of these halves, the end of the games with the clock management. Listen, Waller has got to get up there. The Giants are making substitutions at, with 12 seconds left as the clock is ticking down and they're running up to the line. You can't have that. Everybody has to know what's going to happen. If we catch the ball and get tackled in bounds, everybody has to know. Get to the line, spike it. It was, a, it was a first down. Get to the line, line up, and spike it. I don't care if you have to drag yourself to the line of scrimmage. Darren Waller, you cannot, look, he, you cannot be looking for a substitution. And he put his hand up like, oh, I needed a substitution. And it screwed the whole thing up. The Giants lost 10 seconds. They probably lost two plays, two more shots at the end zone. And then they end up finally spiked it with, with what, three seconds left. Gave them one throw into the end zone. It was intercepted. And that was it. And the Giants have lost now 11 straight games in Philly. 11 straight. They can't beat the Eagles. And not that today we expected them to win. but And they gave them a fight. They, the game was closer than I thought it would be. But again, just these little mistakes and and the dropped passes and the, the quarterback play in the first half and the penalties and the Eagles did everything possible to hand the Giants the game. Okay, the Giants had a pick six. They had a score on, on where they uh, recovered the ball in the 10-yard line off a special teams turnover. It it was, that's an upset. That's how an up, That's the recipe for an upset. You get turnovers, you get defensive touchdowns, you get turnovers on special teams or special teams touchdowns and you get a little luck and, and everything goes right and you get you, you get the upset. And the Giants had everything go right. That all happened today, but they couldn't get over the hump and they couldn't get the ball in the end zone late. And it, you know, it's, it's just the story of this Giants season. It's just a disappointment, a complete disappointment. Uh, again, I think that's it for Tommy DeVito. You, I don't think you're going to be seeing Tommy DeVito again. Uh, I wish him the best. I really, I really do. And, and, and it was a great story, and it was fun for those three weeks. But let's be real. And if you watch the game, you could see that Tyrod Taylor is just a better quarterback. He's, a, he's, a, he's the best back. Tyrod Taylor is one of the best backups in the, in the entire NFL. I, when, when, Daniel, when Daniel Jones went down and Taylor came in to replace him, I felt good about it, that the Giants would be okay. And then he went down, of course, and, and everything kind of went to hell with the season, but he's not a bad backup. He's a serviceable wonderful quarterback. He used to start in the league for the bills. He's won games in the league. He should have started the game today. To be honest with you, I'm surprised he didn't start the game. I really am. And, and DeVito said all the right things after the game, you know, in, in the press conference, and that's what he's going to do. He has to, but man, that was a game. The giants could have won and they could have really done that, done damage to the Eagles because with Dallas's loss, Yesterday to the to Miami, the Giants and the Eagles could have been the Eagles and Dallas. It would have got brought Dallas right back into the conversation for the division. But again, they couldn't do it. And and I don't know what's going on with the the time management. And how does he know? How does Waller not know there? When he catches the ball and he's down on the ground, get your ass up and get to the line and get lined up. We don't need you to run a play. We don't need nothing. We need you to line up. You could be laying on the damn ground for all we care about. 
As long as you're behind the line of scrimmage, we're going to spike it, save the clock. We need to get two or three chances into the end zone here or get us a little closer where we could have at least a reasonable shot at a play in the end zone to finish the game. And he laid there, he rolled around, and he got up. He called for a substitute. Giants were running substitutions, and you can't have that. They did the same thing against uh, the Bills earlier this year where they screwed up at the two-yard line on the where they ran the ball. Tyrod Taylor, again, was the quarterback there. And I don't know if they're not communicating in the huddle, but you got to know that. Just That's just football IQ, regular stuff. That's regular stuff. You got to know the situation, the score, the time remaining, the down, stuff like that. Get up and get on sides and spike the ball and give yourself two shots into the end zone. Because the fact that they, they got one shot into the end zone after making that good play on that fourth down to Waller, his first catch, by the way, his first catch of the whole game. He, he, he's, he's invisible out there. He's been one of the worst free agency pickups. He's been hurt, and when he plays, he does nothing. Right? You never see Darren Waller making big plays for this Giants team. Never. It's usually because he's hurt, he's not on the field, or he's out there and he's doing nothing. And that was a big mistake today. At the end of the game, in the fourth quarter, they could have had maybe one or two sh- more shots in the end zone. You never know. You never know. But we will never know as the Giants lose. They're now officially eliminated from playoff contention if, if you had some kind of delusional hope that they were going to go to the playoffs. But now they're officially mathematically eliminated. Uh, the other game, the Chiefs, listen, uh, I don't know what's wrong with the Chiefs. I told uh, I told you that there's something wrong with them. Mahomes is not he's not Mahomes this year. He just doesn't look it. Now I thought this was going to be the game where they could kind of get right. They got the Raiders. It's a rivalry. It's at home. It's on Christmas. It's in front of the country. I figured they'd come out and they put their best foot forward. Right? You got to figure that that's what they're going to do. And they didn't. They came out. They fell behind the eight ball right away. They were behind in the game the whole game. You got Mahomes throwing picks all over the place. Stuff that he doesn't do. And the credit the Raiders and credit Antonio Pierce. And I think Antonio Pierce, I think the Raiders got to give him that job now. He's really turned this team around. Now, yeah, they're, they're seven and eight, but they might finish 500. They might finish a game over 500. Do you believe that? The Raiders. Antonio Pierce absolutely deserves a chance next year. A full season as the head coach coming in. His team, I think they, they, they have to give him the chance, and especially now if he beat, beat the, the Chiefs like this on Christmas Day. I mean, you had Mahomes. He was 27 of 44, a touchdown, a pick, 235 yards. And this game really turned in the, in the first half when the Raiders got two defensive touchdowns in a matter of three plays. Three plays and bam, bam, they score, fumble, and then a pick six the other way. And all of a sudden, it, it's like the, the Chiefs got rocked and they, they, they got shell-shocked and they couldn't get themselves together. And they ended up losing 20-14. to 14. I mean, again, give the Raiders credit. The defense played well, but there was something wrong with Kansas City. And I, I don't know what it is. Mahomes is off. I know I, I've been saying he doesn't have a receiver that he really trusts, that he likes to throw to. Since he lost Hall, he doesn't have that guy that he could really trust. And it shows he, he tries to he tries to do too much. And even the great Mahomes is really struggling this year. Now, now they're going to have to go on the road. Now, we've never seen Mahomes and this chief, chief team play a road playoff game, which is absurd, by the way. The fact that they've had this run and they haven't had to go on the road in the playoffs once. I mean, that's just a testament to how great the, te- the, the run is for the Chiefs. But this year, now listen, now they're going to have to go on the road. They're going to have to win a road playoff game. It would shock me zero if somehow the Chiefs ended up in the Super Bowl or they ended up in Baltimore and Championship Sunday playing the Ravens. It really wouldn't. But it would also not shock me at all if they went out in Super Wild Card Weekend. So it, it's just a, I have no idea because they're not a bad team. The Chiefs are a good team. They're an actor. They, they have... Mahomes, who's an all-time great. They have Kelsey, who's a first ballot Hall of Famer. They have a, a good defense. This is the best defense they've had during this run. But they make the mistakes, and a lot of times it's Mahomes making the mistakes, and it's just, you know, you're not used to it. You're used to Mahomes kind of running around doing crazy stuff, and it's just all working out. This year, it's not working out for him. 
And I mean, listen, they, you know, they're still nine and they're still, what are they, nine and six? They're, they're still nine and six. They're probably going to win 10, 11 games. They're still going to the playoffs. They're going to have to go on the road. And like I said, they are going to be a tough out. I do think that it's going to come back to bite them and they will get, they, but it, and they will get picked off in that first or second week, probably the second week, divisional weekend. But listen, I wouldn't surprise me at all if they, we wake up and we find them in Vegas. Somehow, some way, they put it together. Andy Reid and Mahomes put it together, and they figure this thing out, and they get to another Super Bowl. It just wouldn't shock me because they're that great. And this is completely, completely out of character for them all season. Just something's been off with the Chiefs, and and you know they're, they're losing games that they should win. They also almost lost to the. If you remember, the, even the Jets game, they almost lost. So, you know, the, the, there's that going on. So the Giants blow an opportunity at an upset, a really a, a, a chance to spoil the one seed for the Eagles. They, they can't beat Philadelphia, okay? It's been, dec- it's been a decade now since they, since they really had, had a win against Philadelphia. It's a big win. The Ravens and the nightcap, what was supposed to be a good game, turned out to be a blowout. Ravens go into San Francisco, blowout. The, the Niners and prove, I think, that they are the best team in the NFL and they are the team to beat, at least in the AFC. And then, of course, the early game was the Chiefs and Mahomes and they lose 20 to 14. The Raiders are now seven and eight and you got to give Antonio Pierce that job, I think. And I, I don't, I, I would announce it before the end of the season. It might even give a jump to, you know, a little bit of a, of a boost to the team. Maybe they finish 500. Maybe they finish a game over 500. You know, listen, that's a, that's a hell of a job. He's come in and done to step into the mess that what that that was. And to, to have that team respond and play the way they have over the last couple of weeks for Antonio Pierce. I think he absolutely a thousand percent deserves the job. It deserves a chance. Give him a full season. Let's see what he can do. Maybe he's a coach. Maybe he's a good coach. Who knows? But I think he's earned it. He's absolutely earned it. Ah. Uh, now, that's the NFL story. Usually, of course, Christmas Day is a basketball day, NBA, right? It's kind of like the day the NBA starts. You could, you, you've played a little bit enough of the season. You have, you have the in-season tournaments already done. You got L.A. hanging banners. But Christmas Day is usually, it's a day for the NBA. It's the NBA day, right? But the what did the NFL do? They usurped it. They saw that, uh, oh, it's a Monday? Oh, we have a game on Monday. Let's throw three games. There was no need for three games. Okay, we could we would have been just as happy as we always are sitting there watching NBA basketball all day, having these games played yesterday on Sunday when they should have been played. It could have it could have saved uh, an extra day for these teams to prepare for next week. It's just it's just too much. It's like the NFL has to they have to fill everything if it's there and there's space and there's nothing going on, or even if there is something going on. We're gonna we're gonna come in and now we're the thing going on. Because you can believe you could you take it to the bank that the NBA did not do the ratings that they usually do because of the NFL. And it's not a Sunday. If Christmas falls on a Sunday, I get it. That's fine. Then that's the NFL's day. But on a Monday, you're gonna throw three games. Not that I'm complaining because I, I liked it. I watched all the games. I liked that there was football on, but but come on. I mean, come on. And they hi- you could have just thrown the night game on Monday night. Could have played it at four o'clock. You didn't have to play it at at you know eight thirty, whatever time it was. But they had to do it. They the the, the NFL. They will play as but they're going to be playing six days a week in a couple of years. You just watch. These guys are going to be playing back to backs in the NFL. <laughs> um, but as listen, as far as the NBA did go, the Knicks. The Knicks with a big win at the Garden and Jalen Brunson again coming through with 38 points. He, he, he was the star of the show again. He is the he is the heartbeat of this Knicks team. And when he where he goes and as far as he as far as Jalen Brunson goes is as far as this Knicks team is going to go. OK, they're going to get another star. I, I don't know if they're going to get another another star, you know, but this team is good and they're fun and they're, they're easy to root for. And the fact that Jalen Brunson in the Garden, the Knicks have played the most. The Knicks have played the most uh, Christmas Day games out of any 
NBA team. I think it was 55 or 56 of them. This was the first uh, Christmas Day game for the Giants. So, you know, big difference there. But the Knicks play every year. There's still that noon game. Win 129 to 122, a seven-point win over the defending champs. They led from wire to wire. The Knicks, they opened up like a seven, eight-point lead in the first quarter. It was 11 by the second quarter, and it stayed there basically until late third quarter. Late third quarter, the Bucks made a run. They got it to four. That was the closest they got it. Then the Knicks pushed it back up to 10, 11. It was at 15 and 16 at one point in the second half. They ended up winning by seven and a good win. Like I said, a good win for the Knicks. You know, they they now, you know, they're, they're just playing a good win for the Knicks. An absolutely good win. They're now in the sixth seed. If that, I mean, if that matters, it's still way early. But they're, they're, they're 17 and 12. They're five games over 500. They're playing better. They are, let's see, in their last 10, they're, they're five and five in their last 10. But they've been playing better. They got off to the slow start. I told you not to worry because those were teams that were mostly better than them. And Milwaukee's better than them. It's good that this team, the Knicks team, can show up to a big game and beat a team that's better than them on their home court on Christmas in front of the country. That's a big win for the Knicks. It's a big win for the Knicks. These basketball games on Christmas Day are a big deal. And to to beat the defending champs on your court where your star gets 38 points, listen, that's all you can ask for. And if the, and if Jalen Brunson is on, the Knicks can compete with anybody in this league. That's why I was so upset a couple weeks ago when Thibodeau left him out there in a 10-point game with 20 seconds left and he rolled his ankle. I mean, how stupid could you be? What a stupid way to have this season basically go down the tubes because he was out there in garbage time. But luckily, the next quarter break, they got lucky there. Okay, they, they, Don't be playing games with that again. Don't be playing around with that because he's going to go down. And you can't afford him to go down. And they have a good chemistry, this team, right now. The Knicks have played well. Listen, give the Knicks credit. It was fun. It was fun day at the Garden for those who were there. The Knicks get it from, from, from multiple players, too. Brunson leads the charge. Okay, He is 38. He's the heartbeat. He's the point guard. The Knicks, see, this is why we've been saying for years and years that they need a point guard. When you have a point guard that runs the team and is the floor general on the floor, everything just runs smoother and he makes the players around him better. RJ Barrett had 21. Randall had 24. Um, quickly had 20. It, it, it spreads it out and he, and he distributes the ball and he can make shots and he knows when he needs to make a shot. He had a, that big three point play, right? When the Bucks were making a run back, they got it to four. He went, he got a three-point play, then he hit a three on the next on the ne- next trip down, and it was back up to nine. And that's what a star player does in the NBA. Is he a superstar? No. Can he win a title with him as your best player? Probably not. But it's better than what we've had. And we got a taste of it last year in the playoffs, and this team can make a playoff run. They do need to add somebody if they want to be in the, the championship conversation because they're not in the championship conversation right now. They're fifth in the conference. They're seven game, they're five games over 500. They're playing better. They're a good NBA team, but they are not in the elite level like we saw with the Celtics and the Lakers. And they're just not up to the elite level, championship level, like, like say, uh, the Celtics or even the Lakers, who I think are kind of up to up to that level. The, the, they met today. Uh, that was the second game. The Celtics beat them. The one they 126, 115. He had a big game by Porzingis, which is, you know, it kind of hurts you when you see Porzingis play as well as he did today, right? He had uh Porzingis had 28 points. He led the he led the Celtics. You had Tatum with 25. You had Holiday with 18, White with 18. The Celtics are an excellent team. They are, they are top in the in the in the conference. They are gonna go into the playoffs as the top seed in the conference, probably right there with Milwaukee. The Knicks, they beat the Knicks a couple times. Listen, the Celtics, and th- th- that's a level of team that the Knicks aren't up there yet. They're not there. They're not with the, the, the Bucs, and they're not with, they're not, even though they beat the Bucs today, and that's why it's such an impressive win, because they beat a team that's better than them. The, the, the Bucs are the NBA champions, defending NBA champions. The Celtics are a better team, too. But the Knicks are kind of there, and they're in the mix, and they can make a run, and it's fun when the Knicks make a run, right? We all saw it the last couple of years. They didn't even make a run. They start, They win a couple playoff games, and it, the feel in the city is just completely different. But if they really make a run, if they were to make a run to like the conference finals, 
something like that. And they were close to the conference finals last year. But if they were to make a, a real deep run and you got the Rangers making a deep run, oh, and a lot of people, there's a whole generation that have never seen that. They've never seen the Knicks and Rangers good at the same time. I mean, I remember in the mid nineties, it was great every year. You'd have hope for a championship and we, we didn't get any. We got the one in 94 and that's it, but we'd have hope for it. And it, it's a lot of fun. It makes the spring a lot of fun. It's just great. It's a different feel to the city. Uh, the NFL yesterday on Sunday, there was some, there was a lot of good games. A lot of, a lot of the playoff pictures kind of starting to take shape now. Um, you had Denver, Denver in that night game against against the Patriots, and uh, Denver just blew a huge opportunity. I mean, listen, they were one and five. They started the season one and five. They're trying to be only the third team to start a season one and five and come back and win and make the playoffs. And they were on pace too. And then last night they just ran into the and they ran into the Bill Belichick and the Patriots and Zappy and and they are not a good team. Okay, the, they should be killing the Patriots at home, at mile high. They were the third quarter. The Patriots got two quick touchdowns. They were up 23-7. The, the crowd was ready to, to run the Broncos out of the building. They would have needed security to get them off the field. That's how bad it was. Then they came back. They had a frantic comeback. They come two touchdowns, two two-point conversions. They tie the game. They stop New England three and out. They get the ball back with under two minutes left. You figure all the momentum in the world is with Denver here. They just had a huge comeback. New England's going nowhere this year. New England defense give them credit because they came up with a big stop. Forced the punt. Couple plays later down the line. The kicker for New England who's missed extra points in the game, who's missed field goals in the game, gets up there and drills one right down the pike for a game winner at the buzzer. And the Patriots just shatter the playoff hopes of the of Denver. A um, couple other key games yesterday, the Seahawks. The Seahawks come back. They win again. This is like the kind of the, the, the comeback, the cardiac kids this year is the Seattle Seahawks and, and Geno Smith. And Geno Smith, again, for the second straight, straight week, let him on a drive at the end of the game to a game-winning fourth-quarter comeback drive. He threw for 227 yards. He had two touchdowns. And then the Browns, the Browns with Joe Flacco. And Joe Flacco has been the best quarterback the Browns has had, have had in years. Some of these games he are putting together, he threw for 400 yards yesterday. But this is the same Joe Flacco that couldn't play last year for the Jets. Remember? Amari Cooper sets an all-time record for the Browns. He has 11 receptions, 265 yards, two touchdowns. It's a Browns record. You got Flacco throwing the ball all over the field. The Browns win 36 to 22 over the Texans, who have kind of fallen off now. Okay, the Texans were a fun story. Jacksonville has fallen. But give the Browns credit. They got 10 wins. They go into the playoffs. They're going to be a tough out, right? They're going to be a tough out. And then the Browns' old friend, Baker Mayfield, has revitalized his career in Tampa. He's winning games all over the place. Tampa has come out of nowhere. They are now have the front, have the lead. In the NFC South, it's kind of a division that somebody's going to have to win. But Baker Mayfield, and they're not a good team. There's not a single good team in that division. But Baker Mayfield has made himself a lot of money, and he's going to get a contract for next year. And he's kind of played himself from obscurity of a, of a backup, washed-up guy who couldn't get it done. And he's revitalized his career in Tampa this season. He's been playing excellent football. Excellent. And he's got that team going to the playoffs. Baker Mayfield in Tampa and Joe Flacco in Cleveland. Give them credit. Give them credit. Also, congratulations to the Detroit Lions and any Detroit Lions fans out there. 30 years. 30 years they waited. They finally have a division title. Okay. Barry Sanders was, was the running back the last time the Lions won a division title. They had they had the Vikings, and the Vikings had a lot to play for. This division was not as cut and dry as I thought it would be a couple, about a month ago. I figured the, the, the Lions would run away with it. They didn't. You have now the Vikings, the Lions have to go into Minnesota. If they lose this one, they could meet Minnesota at home for a winner take all in the division on the final week. They bear down. They play good defense. They turn the ball over. They stopped a last minute drive with an interception at the goal line and the Lions 
for the first time in 30 years, are division champions. So congratulations to them. The Jets, ah, oh, the Jets yesterday, uh, on Sunday. The Jets almost blew with that lead, and I would have fired the whole coaching staff right there if they lost that game. Now, they wouldn't have because right after the game, they came out, the ownership, Hess, and then, you know, they all came out and they said, Salah's coming back. The GM's coming back. Rodgers approves. That's all we need because he's running the team. And now, and, and they're coming back. And it, to make it like that, to even announce it before the season ends, like they've done a good job. Like, how is it that the Jets have announced that Salah's safe and he's going to be the coach? Yet the Raiders have yet to announce that Antonio Pierce is going to get the job. Look at the con- the contrast. I mean, come on. Jets do everything backwards. They do everything wrong. I fully expect the Rodgers thing next year to just tank for whatever reason. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no rhyme or reason as to explain to why that's going to happen. It's because it's the Jets. And it's real that they they just can't do anything right. They never do anything right. And to me, to come out... After you almost blew a 28-7 to lead to a terrible team like the Redskins and you win by the skin of your teeth on a field goal with the gun to come out after the game with a vote of confidence for your head coach and your GM who has done nothing but screw up all year and his whole coaching staff. I mean, could you be more tone deaf? Come on. But that's the Jets. That's what the Jets do. That's why they will always be spinning their tires and they will never get anything accomplished. Because that's what the Jets do. And it's sad. And I hate it for their fans. Because I don't hate the Jets. You know, I root for the Jets. I'm a Giants fan. But I root for the Jets. It's the the Yankees-Mets mentality. It's the big brother, little brother thing. I get the Jets fans don't like the Giants because we're the big brother. We're better. We have all the titles. It's the same thing with the Mets and Yankees. And I get it. I get it. Because I'm on, because in football, I'm on the, the, the big brother side. In baseball, I'm on the little brother side. So I get it. I get it from both angles. It makes sense to me. Um, Yamamoto, real quick. Listen, the Mets did everything they could. Steve Cohen did everything he could. He put the offer out there. It was the highest offer. It was matched. He chose to go to L.A. I'm not upset about that. I am upset that nobody chooses the Mets. Now, I get it. It makes sense for him. It's out on the West Coast. His buddy Otani just signed there. They have a ton of money. They they have a win now team. They, you know, they're perennial in the playoffs. The Mets look like they're kind of punting on next year. And now, especially, it looks like they're punting on next year. But even before they got, you know, to him on the outside, look at is that a win now team? Compared to the Dodgers, it's not. But it still sucks because it's really all we hung our hats on this whole offseason was Yamamoto. And we threw all the money at him, right? Our biggest gripe for how many years was we don't have money. They don't spend. Now we have money. We spend. And they don't want to come here. So it's kind of, you know, it's depressing. I think it's a bigger deal for the Yankees that he didn't go. I think the Yankees were outbid by the Mets. I think the Yankees were outbid by the Dodgers. And that's that's, that's something that doesn't happen. In the past, that didn't happen. The Yankees weren't outbid by anybody. Now they're getting outbid. And also because this is a big, big season for the Yankees. They got Soto. This is it. Soto's on the contract for this year. After this year, he's a free agent. And don't be surprised if the Mets come and swoop him up. And I know I'm a Mets fan, and I know it's biased, and it sounds biased. But do not be surprised if next year, because next year is going to be the offseason where the Mets are going for it. And do not be surprised if, if Cohen comes in and makes him an offer that, that's just out of this world. And he takes it because he's a Boris client. He goes for the most money. He always opts out. They always go to free agency. Listen, do not be surprised if Soto's a Met in 2025. So that means you got just this year, Yankees. And this was a big piece because you have no pitching. You have Cole. And then you have a bunch of question marks. Some guys who you were good. Some guys who were supposed to be good, but they weren't good. Injuries. Yamamoto would, it was huge for the Yankees to get. And they didn't even go the extra mile, throw the extra 25, 30 million over 10 years. It's nothing. They wouldn't even do that to get them. And that says a lot about the, you know, where the Yankees are in their spending. And that's where they've been now for the last decade. But as far as it goes for him going to the Dodgers, listen, 
And and the fact that MLB still hasn't even uh, broached the subject of the Otani contract, like how do we how do they not come out and say, explain to us, explain to me how that the Dodgers are not trying to circumvent the luxury tax with the Otani contract and all the deferred money. Explain to me what's the other what's the reason behind it, except for the fact that they are circumventing the the luxury tax. There's no other reason. There's business reasons that they want to save money, but that that's it doesn't matter because it gives the appearance that you're circumventing the luxury tax. I don't know. I, I just can't believe they haven't done anything and it doesn't look like they're going to, which is crazy to me. So that does it. That does it for us here. Listen, I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope you have a happy new year. We're going to have a year review show coming up next week. I'm, I'm hoping Brett could be there because it's going to be fun to do. Um, I hope you had a great Christmas. Enjoy the family. I hope you got everything on your list. Uh, everybody loved the presents you gave them. Santa brought everything. Listen, Merry Christmas, everybody. Talk to you later this week. I'm Bob Walters. Thanks for watching, everybody. See ya.